Welcome to the third film in our series about the future of British woodlands. In the last film, Dougal Driver made the case for looking after and managing the woodlands and forests that we already have before rushing to plant new trees. However, there is a very strong case for dramatically increasing woodland cover in this country, either through new planting or through natural regeneration. If there is then an acceptance that we need more trees and more woodland, the obvious next questions are, what trees do we plant, as in what species, and where do we plant them? And to help us answer these questions, we're joined today by Jez Ralph of Timber Strategies in the beautiful Dartington Estate. Good morning, Jez. Morning, great to see you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, this beautiful location we're in. Well, I've been in forestry for 20 years now um, and I spend about a third of my time with forest owners and I work with timber processors and I work with architects and timber users covering the whole supply chain. I've got a small business, Timber Strategies, uh, that works in an office here on Dartington Estate. And we're standing in Dartington Estates Woodlands today because they have a hundred year history of innovation in new planting and in forest management and in looking at different species and experimentation. Jez, can you give us a brief history of forestry in the UK? Well, we've been managing our forests for millennia, uh, since well before the Bronze Age. And since then, we've gone through a real roller coaster ride of taking down large areas of forest and replanting them. And that's because timber was the plastic of the past. We used it for everything and needed it for everything, for shipbuilding, for our navy, for house building, and for everything else. And this led to a situation at the end of the Second World War, where we had virtually no trees left in the country. And our response to that was to put in a strategic reserve and plant vast areas of monocultural conifer. And following that, come the 80s and 90s, there was a real environmental response to that of planting native broadleaf woodlands. And so we're left in a situation now where we have on the one hand these big conifer plantations and on the one hand these smaller broadleaf woodlands. Jez, I've heard the term resilient woodland a lot. Can you tell me what it means and why it's important? Resilient woodland, I think, is a woodland that has its focus the long term. It's about a healthy forest. And so it's moving away from those pure monocultural plantations or those very pure mixed native woodlands and saying what's best for the soils and what's best for the site and what's best for the future of society. Because times are changing very dramatically. Mm. Climate change is bringing in a lot of new diseases and storm damage from increased storms and society is changing a lot as well and society wants more natural environmentally friendly products and our forests have to cope with all these things and they need to be resilient. The, the introduction of novel species, some might describe as non-native species, is quite controversial. There are those that, that don't believe that these species can fill the ecological niches left behind by what we might term as native species. So what, what are your thoughts on this? I think that we need to move away from being focused on the actual species themselves and look at the structure and diversity in the forest. So having a forest where there's a lot of different light levels in it, where the soil is healthy and the understory is healthy, is a resilient forest. And I think you can do that no matter what the species are, as long as they're not invasive species that are going to take over. And we're in this forest here now, and uh, behind us are some giant redwoods, some sequoia, mm. and some Douglas fir that are all what people would call introduced species, but are okay. actually regenerating very well. Yet just on the other side of the track, we've got oak and beech woodland, all growing very well together mm. in a mixed woodland. And the, the, the understory here, to me, looks quite healthy. It is. It's incredibly healthy. And that's because 
we have different light levels in here. Plenty of sunlight reaching the floor and that understory being healthy feeds into the soil structure and gives you a good ecology in the soil structure that helps the trees grow and you have this virtuous circle of a well-managed resilient healthy forest and it's about forest health not about species that's important if we accept that we need to think about new and novel species because of climate change and because of pests and pathogens what is the right decision making process and how do we make sure that we're not going to introduce more problems for the trees that we have? First and foremost, we need to put the right species in the right place. It's crucially important that our forests are healthy. And whether we use traditional species or new species, we've got to have healthy forests. And then it's about deciding what those trees give to the ecology and give to society as a whole and how resilient they are to future climates and how resilient they are to pests and diseases. And it's an incredibly complicated um, decision-making process that I find quite intimidating and exciting all at the same time. But the end point is we're trying to say what will this species give to this forest in a hundred years time and give to our future generations in a hundred years time. A more diverse forest with a wider range of species and um, a greater age mix is surely going to be a more complicated forest to manage. Do we have the, the level uh, of silver cultural skill in this country to, to make that work into the future? These new complex forests are really exciting and they are more complex. And we probably don't have the right skills because we've been brought up as a generation in managing monocultural plantations. And it's hugely exciting. It's almost a return to the, the real craft and detailed knowledge mm. of silviculture, the growing of trees, knowing the site and knowing the soils. And that craft, that old traditional craft, is being combined with a new technological craft of using drones in the forest and 3D scanning um, and of automated processes and so we need those young people that can do that technological work but are also interested in the environment and the complexity of these new forest systems. Uh, I'd love to be a young forester today. <laughs> As you know Jez, I'm uh, a saw mill owner uh, and we, we buy in uh, British timber from, from all over the UK what I'm interested in is, is with these more complex, resilient woodlands, is it going to make it more difficult and more expensive to harvest timber um, and, to, and then to process it on in sawmills like mine? It might make it more difficult, more complex and more expensive. But I think we have to change the way we look at timber supply for you. And in the past, as foresters, we've been dictated by what the customer wants. But now we have a much better understanding. And things like climate change mean that we have to manage forests for their own health first and foremost. No healthy forest, no timber for you at all. Healthy forest might mean a more complex forest. And it might mean that the timber's more expensive. It might mean you have different species and different diameters but that's the way it'll have to be. Jez, what are your hopes and fears for the future of British forests and forestry? I think one of my biggest fears is that our political system perhaps struggles to cope with the long-term nature of forestry and incentives are quite short-term and fit into election cycles rather than a 50 or 100 year mm. cycle. And I fear that um, perhaps we don't at the moment have the silvicultural craft to really understand these new forests but my hopes and excitement is that there's a new generation of people coming in that can combine all these exciting elements and create incredibly healthy forests but my biggest biggest hope is I suppose that as a society we can embrace evolving forests 
and really build up a wood culture back in the country again. What is your number one policy suggestion for the future of British forests? That we should stop siloing forestry in one place and agriculture in another and other land uses in another, but start thinking about cohesive landscapes where forestry and agriculture are mixed together into one ecological unit. Jez, it's been a, a wonderful day, a really interesting day uh, in this beautiful location. So let me say thank you very much for taking the time to give us your input on this uh, thoroughly fascinating subject. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Today we've learnt that it is possible to introduce new and novel species into our woodlands, to take over from some of the, the native species we have which are struggling. But we have heard that there, there are challenges with that, uh, not least how to select those species and the, the, the silvicultural skills required to manage the woodland and also the added complexity that comes from uh, introducing more species and, and different age classes. Now we can't hide from the fact that there are problems in our woodlands but from Jez I think we've learned that if we can embrace this new style of forestry and we can embrace the need for a wider range of species there is a positive future for our woodlands and we can make sure that we have woodlands that are growing um, that are vibrant and are able to produce raw material for the future so we're going to carry on with this project we've got many more films to do so i hope that you will keep watching uh, and engage with us in the future and uh, we look forward to doing the next film.